So these are times, Angela Davis told the Left Forum last night, for deep thinking and analysis. Feminist analysis, she said, in fact, of the interlinkages of our issues. Among those, we live in a nation that locks seven million of us behind bars, that's engaged in its longest, most costly war on terror, even as 46 million face the terror of hunger and poverty at home, a terror that forces many to sign up to serve in, that, in those same wars. We live in a nation where the richest 0.1%, those with $20 million or more, have doubled their share of our nation's wealth since the 1960s. Under our system of rigged prices, monopoly capitalism, and financialization of every bit of us down to our very homes, that wealth of the top 1,000th compounds, as does the poverty. And the two parties of property, with their police, and their borders, and their drones, and their detention camps, keep it that way, and our money media calls it a democracy. These are the times that try men's souls, wrote Thomas Paine in 1776, speaking of life under British rule. In this special luncheon feature, three men accustomed to deep thinking are going to apply themselves to the legacy of pain and consider the standards he identified for rebellion. Are they met as well today in the corporate imperial age of the Koch brothers as they were then under the hereditary rule of George III and the Royal East India Company? Angela Davis called on us to consider our history. I've been asked just briefly to sketch pains. In order to do that just briefly, I'd say that his common sense, rights of man, and age of reason were the most widely read political essays of the 18th century, not only in this country, but in Europe too. Common Sense, published in 1776, is credited with giving the War of Independence its rhetorical fire and its vision of a non-hereditary state with a constitution. He gave us the terms United States and counter-revolution too, and he lived long enough to see and participate in his way, I would say, in both. He died in Greenwich Village in 1809. Common Sense, the idea, came with him from the UK, where he was born in 1737 in a region called East Anglia. His were rebellious times, where the echoes of the levelers and the diggers hung in the air. Common people who'd fought privatization and the enclosure of land and found themselves executed and incarcerated en masse because they demanded their natural born right to the commons. Payne apprenticed as a corset maker, a profession that took off as women's lives, not just our wastes, were being shrunk from robust, vital things, equal participants in life, to child rearers, enclosed domestic objects, at least women of a certain class. In 1757, Paine went to sea aboard the King of Prussia as egalitarian-minded sailors and pirates protested impressment, forced labor, forced service in the military. Paine stood up against impressment in the rights of man. Aboard ship, as historian Peter Leinbaugh has taught us, Paine would have served with people from all over the world, including Africans, Irish, and blacks from the Caribbean. He would have participated or at least witnessed their grumbling and perhaps their rebellions on board ship. He certainly was aware of their rebellions against the British throughout the 1700s, in which Caribbean blacks, Africans, Irish, and even some of the colonized Americans too, but certainly the hetero, homo, multi-gendered mob, the rowdies, carried with them the, world, uh, the word of slave revolts into the streets of what were to become the United States, including New York's own streets. Those slave revolts, let's date them, Jamaica, 1760, Bermuda and Nevis, 1761, Suriname, 62, 63, 68, and 72, British Honduras, Grenada, Montserrat, St. Vincent, Tobago, St. Croix, St. Thomas, St. Kitts, throughout the 1760s and the 70s, there were rebellions, and they moved to the south, 
Alexandria, Virginia in 1767, Perth Amboy, New Jersey, 1772, St. Andrews Parish, South Carolina, and in a joint African and Irish effort in Boston in 1774. Thomas Paine arrived in America that year and immediately wrote against slavery. We have it in our powers to begin the world over again, he wrote in Common Sense. Twenty years later, in agrarian justice, he acknowledged that even after independence, the world was in need of serious remaking. He wrote, the present state of civilization is as odious as it is unjust. It is absolutely the opposite of what it should be, and it is necessary that a revolution should be made in it. The contrast of affluence and wretchedness continually meeting and offending the eye is like dead and living bodies chained together. It wasn't just a U.S. problem, it was a global problem, he wrote. The great mass of the poor in all countries have become a hereditary race, and it is next to impossible for them to get out of that state for themselves. For the sake of justice and humanity, he said, not in 76, but in 1796, it is necessary to make change, specifically to make, quote, property productive of national blessing, extending to every individual, not just a few. Are we in times that try our souls? For sure. Let's hear it. Are we? Yes. Are we in revolutionary times? Yes. That's the question we're going to address today. <laughs> And we'll recall Angela Davis, who said we should not be afraid to ask for what we want. What Robin Kelly has called our freedom dreams, she said, need not bear the imprint of compromise. So, ask away, compromise not. To address all of this and more, we have Richard Wolff. Professor of Economics Emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, visiting professor at the New School Graduate Program, author of many wonderful books, including Democracy at Work, A Cure for Capitalism, Occupy the Economy, Challenging Capitalism, and Capitalism Hits the Fan, The Global Economic Meltdown and What to Do About It. He also hosts the wonderful weekly economic update on WBAI-FM in New York. <laughs> and syndicated nationally. Chris Hedges spent 20 years as a foreign correspondent, 15 of those for the New York Times, where he was part of a team that won a Pulitzer Prize until he denounced the Bush administration's call to invade Iraq and <laughs> lost his post at the Times. He's the author of the bestsellers Empire of Illusion, War is a Force that Gives Us Meaning, and Death of the Liberal Class, and he writes a weekly column that you must read for the website Truth Dig. Cornell West has called himself a blues man in the life of the mind. Longtime Princeton professor, now at Union Theological Seminary, he's best known for his classic Race Matters, Democracy Matters, and his memoir, Brother West, Living and Loving Out Loud. He appears frequently on many programs when they let him, as well as on his dear brother Tavis Smiley's PBS TV show. He can be heard weekly with Tavis on Smiley and West, the national public radio program distributed by Public Radio International, and I believe also heard on WBAI. Thank you all. We will, um, the format is going to be as follows. Uh, wonderful Gina Kim here has distributed cards. If you have questions, you should write those questions on a card. We do not, absolutely do not guarantee to answer all your questions. But we will um, sort through, discover some themes, and pose some questions to the speakers um, once they've laid out their argument for about 45 minutes. I'll get a chance to pose a couple of questions of my own and we'll uh, have you out of here in 90 minutes or fewer. Enjoy. How's that? Okay. We selected Payne for a couple reasons. Uh, first of all, he's uh, arguably the only real revolutionary theorist America has produced. Uh, we've produced some admirable anarchists, uh, Emma Goldman and uh, Alexander Berkman, uh, Noam Chomsky, Dorothy Day, and others. Uh, we have produced uh, some uh, powerful prophetic voices uh, out of oppressed communities. 
uh, whether that is, uh, you know, Frederick Douglass or uh, Malcolm X, uh, um, my friend Cornell West and others. Um, but in terms of revolutionary theorists, we have uh, almost none. Uh, Paine may be uh, the only one. Uh, in many ways, he was the first uh, intellectual in the sense that he never tied himself to a political party. He was always in opposition to power. Uh, and I thought I'd open the discussion uh, with Rick and Cornell uh, by uh, highlighting some of his major strengths, ones that I think we can learn from. Uh, the first would be that Paine, in a way that uh, many of the uh, uh, four uh, figures of the revolution were not, uh, understood the monarchy, understood British power. He didn't come to the United States until he was 37. And part of his job in common sense was to explain the structures of power to the colonies uh, who didn't understand them. Even figures like Benjamin Franklin uh, up until the very last moment wanted to build a rapprochement with uh, the king. Uh, and Payne, it was part of Payne's job at, to explain why this wasn't possible. And I think one of the things that uh, I think all three of us probably feel, and I'll stop in a second and let you both address this, is that uh, there has been a misreading on the part of the American left and even among the progressive community of the structures of power, and for that reason it has rendered us impotent. We have effectively been channeling our energy back into a dead political system. Uh, I wrote uh, many of Nader's major speeches for him in the 2008 election, and going back to 2008, um, there were a lot of people at the left forum who had uh, drunk the Kool-Aid for Barack Obama. And I think that that was because they had uh, quite been diverted quite effectively into the personal narrative of a candidate, which is irrelevant uh, uh, in terms of understanding the mechanisms of power. And just as Paine understood that the imperial power of the British uh, uh, had essentially blinded itself, that, that its hubris uh, made it incapable of listening, which is why you had one of the largest armadas, uh, 350 ships sent on New York. Uh, I think we are in a very similar moment as well. And uh, maybe begin, Cornell, with you and talk a little bit about the, that idea of structure of power. Uh, yeah. Did you want to say something, Brother Wolf, before I say something? No. Okay. That's all. Uh, I think it's for me, it's not just a question of that structural power. It's true that, that Thomas Paine uh, comes at, 30, at 37 years old to the new world and already has a critique of not just good and bad kings, but of monarchy as a whole. So he's talking about a structural systemic analysis that most of the Americans at the time had not moved toward that in 1776 there were over 400 pamphlets published, the one pamphlet we still read, Common Sense. So there's a number of voices being lifted, but here this 37-year-old who arrives lays bare this critique of the structure of power, but keep in mind who he was. His father was a Quaker. He, in he inherited a fundamental solidarity with the downtrodden, with those who were excluded that he was willing always to cut radically against the grain and his conception of himself at 37 was he was going to die, or he was going to be willing to die if he, ensuring that he would act honorably, think critically, that he would be willing to sacrifice his popularity for truth and justice and would always fuse with other folk on the ground in grassroots movements. And so even as he lays bare this critique of structure of power, he has a conception of himself that is Quaker-like. I mean, he was not an atheist, he was a deist. He hated organized religion. He hated dogma, especially religious dogma, but also ideological dogma, and viewed himself as first and foremost a member of those slash stone called everyday people. He was a commoner to the core, and he engaged in a revolutionary act in how he wrote, not just what he wrote, because how he wrote was a critique of the pomposity and the obscurity of the Latin, of the Latin Greek obsessed language of the Edmund Burks and others. 
that he was going to speak a language that was so clear. He said, I want to write as plain as the alphabet for common folk because I come out of the common folk. So that was a revolution in form and style. And it was the first time that folk who hardly could read at all could be read to and get through a language that was part of their colloquial style. That was part of how they communicated. Going back to the artisanal class, he was not working class, he was an artisanal class in, in Thetford Village there in, in, in Norfolk, but he fundamentally identified with the common folk. What we don't have today is, we don't have intellectuals, because he was the first American modern intellectual unconnected. No doubt about that. What we don't have today are intellectuals who have not been seduced by the professional managerial carrots and the subculture of the university who are fundamentally committed to the plight and predicament of commoners, everyday people, working people, poor people, and view their calling, not their career, as having an organic connection with their struggles, no matter how strong or no matter how weak they are. Now, there are some intellectuals that do that fewer and fewer and fewer. Why? Because what Thomas Paine didn't have to deal with is the backdrop of impending ecological catastrophe, the backdrop of possible nuclear catastrophe, the fashionable character of being cynical and despairing even as you are highly professionally approved and recognized. The sipping tea in the cafes with a sharp analysis, but no willingness to pay a cost. No willingness to take a risk. No, no willingness to cut radically against the grain. And of course, he dealt with the consequences. You talked to me. He died right here in Greenwich Village, 72 years old, six people at his funeral, two of them black, because that critique of African slavery, the first piece he wrote in March of 1775, was real. That led toward the founding of the first anti abolitionist society in the New World. He was fundamentally committed to a critique of white supremacy, very rare oftentimes among highly visible white intellectuals. Brother Chris is rare. Stanley Ryan was rare. Rick Wolf, rare. Eric Foner, rare. We can go, we, we can call a list because the list's so short. I'm not just talking about making a symbolic gesture. I'm talking about fundamentally committed to your analysis to where white supremacy is an integral, an integral factor among other crucial factors, and then you make the organic connection. That's the kind of brother Thomas Paine was, and it is very, very difficult to build on his legacy, even though we have to acknowledge just how crucial that challenge is. I want to pick up on something that you all just did. Uh, when Laura was still speaking before we started, she asked how much change was needed or some words to that effect, and it was a strong, clear statement, yes. Then she asked about revolution, much less strong, much more wobbling. Now, Tom Paine is exactly about that difference. Just as the name of this conference the name we chose for this conference is Reform and Revolution. Faced with a situation that's becoming more and more unequal, unfair, unjust, and intolerable, what are we going to do? And what pain, for me, what makes him stand out is the care that he takes to go right after that question. And the way I hear it, is this. We now face, he says about his time, more than enough evidence, decade upon decade, of accumulated outrages, injustices, attacks on our freedoms, our rights, and our security. In a sense, we've tried to address this one and that one, to work out an accommodation here, to get a reform over there. We've been there, and we've done it, and it hasn't worked, and we got to face that. We can't make reforms most of the time because the power structure arrayed against us blocks us. But even worse, when occasionally we get a reform, that same power structure, having lost the effort to block it, now goes to work to undo it, to reverse it, and to go right back to where they were. 
Therefore, the conclusion Paine reaches and tries to teach the American people then is the same one I think many of us want to teach now. You've got to change the system. Not because it's an alternative to being achieving reforms, but because changing the system is the only way to make a reform that's durable. Revolution is the way you complete the reform process, just as it's the condition for the reforms you get to last and to mean what you wanted them to mean when you fought for them. That's why the word revolution rang in Paine's work so powerfully. It's a big change. Not this, not that. We have to say to the King of England, go home. You're out of here. It's over. The British Empire, hundreds of years of dominance. We, we quit. We're gone. You're out of here. A powerful ending of the colonial relationship that gave this country its modern birth, its whole history. An amazing thing to say to the people to separate. And yet aren't we in the same? Isn't that the legacy for us too? To finally say, and let me pick up on one theme here, because I know many of you have encountered references to, or if you have a lot of time, you've read the book by Thomas Piketty. A lot of time is 600 pages, it takes a long time. And he's a good economist, but as a writer, hmm, not so much. Uh, yes, it's a, in our profession, that's absolutely normal. Um, the, but his point is the same, isn't it? He says he studied capitalism for 250 years. He and his colleague Saez in, in California at Berkeley are the go-to statisticians to understand the distribution of wealth and income in the world these days. And his conclusion in that book, Capital in the 21st Century, is that capitalism inherently, anywhere and everywhere it has been established, produces as its inherent tendency a growing inequality of wealth and income. Periodically, he points out, People get so freaked by this that they push back, and we have a reform. And then as soon as it's over, the same capitalism undoes the reform. And we all know that, don't we, here in the United States? Because the last 40 years is the undoing of the New Deal. There it is, again. And so pain comes to us. And when Chris said to me initially, let's start with Thomas Paine, now I see what was in his mind. He is teaching us, you got to have the courage to make a systemic change. You've been to the reform table. You've tried it repeatedly. You have to learn the lesson. We are at the stage of taking a major new step. So of course we're a little nervous, as your hesitant comments to Laura indicated. But the logic now is something we can understand thanks to pains pushing through the way Chris and Cornell just said. I think the, the thing about pain that's also very important, and Cornell alluded to this, is language. Um, what the linguists call mutual knowledge. Um, and Pinker has written, Stephen Pinker has written about this, that uh, language is a vehicle by which reality uh, is filtered through to you. And part of Paine's power, which is the power of all great revolutionary writers, is that he utterly upended that language to the uh, extent that he redefined terms like democracy. Democracy was a pejorative. Republicanism, or the republic, was a pejorative. And Paine reclaimed those words and gave them a new definition. The other thing, which Cornell also mentioned, which is important about Paine, is that he spoke in the language, or he wrote in the language of everyday people. Now, um, that, as a writer, is deceptive um, because it's actually extremely difficult. Um, Orwell mastered that capacity. Orwell once said that, you know, I want, as a writer, I want to be that clear window pane by which people can see through. And Paine did that. Uh, and when he writes his response to Edmund Burke uh, in uh, The Rights of Man, uh, he goes after 
uh, Burke's very florid style. And I think language, and I'll you know, want to raise this with both of you, is extremely important because we live in a society now where those who have power have created specialized vocabularies that shut the rest of us out. Economists have been particularly good at this, um, but just about the technocrat, and we, and, and we are ruled by technocrats, uh, has created a specialized vocabulary that those of us on the outside are not able to penetrate. And that becomes a kind of barrier in terms of our ability to exercise our rights as citizens to influence power. And Paine understood that extremely well. Um, and it's why his writings were so effective. He, he's an incredible writer. I mean, Common Sense is arguably one of the greatest essays in English. Um, when he writes uh, The Rights of Man, especially the second part, and, and it becomes extremely important because in that second part of The Rights of Man, he actually outlines the whole welfare state. Um, and the Pitt government goes nuts, William Pitt, uh, and they pass uh, the two-act law, which uh, bans, um, just as we see in the wake of the Occupy movement, bans large public gatherings, uh, makes it a lot easier to prosecute people for treason. Uh, Payne himself is tried for sedition and has to flee to France. I mean, his amazing life, he ends up as a, one of two foreign delegates in the National Convention, stands up and opposes the regicide of Louis XVI. The Jacobins turn on him, he ends up in prison. Um, uh, but when he writes The Rights of Man, he gives to the English working class, and you have to remember that the working class in England at the time was in far worse economic state than the white working class in the United States. Uh, three out of four are um, uh, people in uh, large metropolitan cities in Europe were either paupers or beggars. Uh, and, and when the Pitt government, it creates all sorts of uh, uh, worker organizations that begin to discuss political issues, the Pitt government shuts it down and drives it underground. But I think, and E.P. Thompson makes this point, that one of the reasons Payne is actually better known in England is because he gave them the whole vocabulary to the, to the kind of working class radical labor movement. And I think that that's an extremely important issue, and I, and I think that this gets to Rick's point, is people's reaction, is that we are still in a process of searching for the language by which we can, number one, describe the political and social and economic reality that we are enduring and how to respond. And I think at the center of that revolution in form and style of Thomas Paine was a genuine anger, a righteous indignation of the conditions of the people that he was fundamentally working alongside and struggling alongside with. You remember the line 24a of Plato's Apology, Socrates was the cause of my unpopularity. Parisia is plain speech, unintimidated speech, frank speech, speech that is unafraid. It's the language of the great Victoria Garvin or Malcolm X. It's the language of Dorothy Day, of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. It cuts through the jargon. It cuts through specialized language. It gets at the pain but doesn't remain there because it articulates a vision so that there's an alternative to that pain. That is also what's lacking. And that's what Thomas Paine had. And part of the problem is when we, when we do have persons with those voices, what happens? Well, Thomas Paine went to jail in London. He's pushed out. He's 11 months in prison in Paris, luckily makes it out. When he comes back here, he has a critique of George Washington. He has a critique of evangelical religion in the midst of the first awakening. And he is completely pushed aside. So oftentimes, persons who have these voices are either in prison, incarcerated, lied on, character assassinated, literally assassinated, or just pushed to the margins and viewed as some isolated icon that one worships rather than views them as part of a movement. You see, Mumia Abu Jamal, Oscar Lopez Rivera. We can go on and on and on in this regard, you see. So the challenge is how do we build on Payne's example, but we're living in a much more crypto fascist state than he was. That's the lesson of Brother Mumia and others. Those who raise their voices, 
national surveillance state, the national security state is on you. The spies are operating. Folk on the inside, your friends who used to, you thought you could rely on, no, not at all. They're cowardly. They're too conformist. They're too complacent. Who do you rely on then? That's what Thomas Paine was wrestling with most of his life. He dedicates one of the texts to George Washington, right? Next thing you know, George won't get him out of the clinker in Paris. He's living with James Madison in Paris. Then the critique of George Washington is so devastating. George Washington is the icon. When he comes to the state, they won't touch Thomas Paine with a 10-foot fo pole because his critique of George Washington is so unrelenting, he has pulled the cover on the demagogue. Nobody talks about George. He chopped down the cherry tree. <laughs> Nobody talks about George. He sacrificed. Wait a minute. Let's tell a story that's honest and candid about George Washington, especially for someone like Thomas Paine, who, whose view is not just black people, but Thomas Paine in the Eastern Plan in Pennsylvania when he met with indigenous brothers and sisters and went on to write what? They were wiser than the white folk they were talking to. These were my brothers and sisters, these indigenous people. That's a vanilla brother named Thomas Paine talking that way. We don't even have white activists these days enough talking that way with indigenous peoples and brown peoples and black peoples and Asian people. Yeah, we got some in this room. I'm talking about as a movement. As a movement. Why? Because you grew up in such compartmentalized, deodorized spaces where you had very little access to black folk and red folk and yellow folk and others, those vanilla suburbs and went to these nice little elite schools and got sophisticated and and so forth, and not any way connected to what these struggles have been. Thomas Paine refused that, and he dropped, he left school when he was 12 and a half. Now, I'm not recommending that. <laughs> but that's also a way in which he was not incorporated so easily by the gentlemen of his day who never accepted Thomas Paine, never accepted John Adams, Jefferson. Even when they said good things about him, he was still a commoner. You see, it was still so unsophisticated and raw and coarse. You know, the vicious lies told about his personal hygiene and so forth. It may not have been a lie. Maybe he smelled a little bit. Yeah. But, 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 I mean, all the lies that were unimportant relative to the issues that he was talking about. That's how rare he was. That's why it's perfect to start with Thomas Paine. I think also, not to be the, the good news bearer, but let's be clear. Let's be clear. All the people who turned against him, along the way, the vast majority of them, we don't even know who they are. What survived was what this man wrote. And it didn't just survive because he was a great writer. He was. And it didn't just survive because he found ways of changing the meaning of words that brought people alive. The incredible skills. Chris is right. One of the great writers, particularly the great writers of revolutionary literature. The reason, though, he survives is that it's the same question. And when you begin to look, as Chris and, and we did, for what we could build a lasting conversation around, we found him because he addresses the same issue. What is to be done, if I could borrow the way another important leader posed the question, uh, what is to be done? This, this is his recognition. And I think we ought to be, for a moment, proud that the United States produced such a person. Proud that we generated someone who could pose the reform and revolution question so dramatically that even though his coming down on the side of revolution, which frightens so many people, returns now to something we want to talk about and that we want you to return to read and learn from as we have because there's lots of very powerful insight in there about what it is we face now and we do in this country face now an extraordinary structure that has done the things that were so upsetting to to pain one example that was referred to by both of us, uh, all of us Democracy in those days was a word that was akin to chaotic, disorganized, messy, ineffective, negative, negative, negative. 
right? We live, in a sense, in a bizarre reversal. Now it's the holy of holies. But it's all a fake. We celebrated democracy the way we celebrate cowboys in the old days. A complete fantasy, a makeup, so that we can indulge this desire. As an economist, I keep saying this, and I know some of you have heard it from me before. We go to work, we spend five out of seven days a week at our jobs. And when we go to work, which is where we spend most of our adult life, we enter a place in a capitalist society that is the absolute opposite of democracy. A tiny group of people, major shareholders and boards of directors, 25, 30 people, make all the decisions that thousands of employees, not to speak of the communities where these employees work, have to live with. Their participation in those decisions is completely excluded, in principle, in law, and in fact. So we spend most of our adult lives in an institution that is fundamentally undemocratic and pretend we live in a society with a fundamental commitment to democracy. This is crazy. <laughs> but it's a craziness that has to be opened up by the genius kind of vision that a pain brings to it so that you kind of shock a population into recognizing that all along that's what's been bothering me. It isn't just that I'm poor, it isn't just that I'm living in a polluted environment in an overcrowded city, it's that I'm not treated like a human being. And this is, this is revolutionary stuff. That moment of recognition, if you can help it along with the kind of writing he had, that lights the fire. It's very, very powerful. I want to talk about the two weapons that were used against pain most effectively. Uh, the first was vilification. Uh, and when you stand up and speak a truth as powerfully and eloquently as pain does, the state, uh, and this was true both in colonial America and especially true in uh, the England of William Pitt, and even finally in uh, the Jacobin uh, revolutionary France, where they were terrified of Paine's writing, which is why he ends up in the Luxembourg. And he doesn't just end up in the Luxembourg, he's slated for execution. Uh, and the only reason he's not executed is because they would mark the doors of the people to be guillotined the next morning. And his door, the door to his cell was open, and they marked the inside of the door. And at night, the guard closed it. And he sat in the room, holding his breath, waiting as the guards passed, to pull those people out of the Luxembourg who would be guillotined, and they passed him by. That's the only reason Payne is alive. And there's actually an amazing scene where Danton, who had uh, been an ally of Payne, is brought to the Luxembourg and they embrace uh, before Danton is executed. Um, so vilification, uh, there he was followed, uh, the government of, as they do here, funded all sorts of front organizations, letter writing campaigns, uh, and they destroyed him. Uh, that the power of vilification should not be uh, diminished, it works. Uh, and Payne was being burned in effigy uh, by the very people that he was writing for. Uh, in France, of course, he almost dies because he opposes the reign of terror. He was a Quaker. In that sense, he wasn't a good Quaker. They wouldn't let him be buried finally in a Quaker burial, but he opposed the death penalty, including the regicide of the king. And he stood up in the National Convention and gave a quite an eloquent and moving speech as to why even your enemy, you must even protect your enemies because once you begin this kind of reign of terror against those you oppose, it comes back to haunt you. I mean, very prescient as to the direction of the French Revolution. That's the first thing, and I know uh, that uh, Cornel West for speaking the truth about the administration of Barack Obama has suffered from this kind of vilification, uh, but it's a perfect example of what a truth teller has to undergo. The second is historical amnesia. And let's think about it. Thomas Paine was one of the most important founders of our country. Where are the monuments to Thomas Paine? Where he, he's been erased as, as a kind of visible figure. 
and, and this gets into the in, in frightening kind of erasure of the entire radical tradition, which has been extremely effective in the United States. And in a sense, uh, it's a way of, in a kind of Stalinist way of rewriting our own history. I mean, the Communist Party in this country, and if you were a, a, a black person in the 1920s, were you, where were you going to go? That's why Robeson joined the party, because it was integrated. Ruskin and all the tactics that King used came out of communist tactics that were being used in the 20s and the 30s. Um, the Wobblies, I, mean, I don't have to tell this room, you're aware of it. Uh, but Paine represents that radical tradition that the establishment has worked from the beginning of the public to erase. So that um, Paine, even in his own lifetime, as Cornell correctly pointed out, becomes a pariah. I mean, even Jefferson, who had been a friend of Paine, uh, pushes him away. And uh, I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about the mechanism the state uses, vilification and historical amnesia, in order to blunt and destroy the radical prophetic voice. Yeah, and that's so very important. Philadelphia, 100 years, 100 year anniversary of Paine, they took a vote that refused to have a statue anywhere in the city in tribute to him. That's Philadelphia. That's where he struggled. He walked on foot from Trenton to Philadelphia in support of the U.S. military, working with the military under Nathaniel Green and George Washington during the American Revolutionary War, and that's the kind of gratitude. Why? Because, why? Because he was so genuinely revolutionary that once the revolution was over in the United States, we got to move toward the counter-revolutionary status quo as the Federalists set in, as their fear of the French Revolution set in, the John Adams and others. But I do want to add this. Probably the greatest black revolutionary socialist in the early part of the 20th century was a brother named Herbert Harrison. He was the founder of Local 5, Socialist Party. He was the most popular lecturer in the, in the city of New York and was very close to Ingersoll as well as Clarence Darrow. And it was reading Thomas Paine that turned him into not simply a revolutionary, but also an agnostic. Now, Paine was not an agnostic. He was a deist. But when Hubert Harrison, I just, I, he's a, he was a genius. He's a Caribbean genius. Came off the boat, came straight to Harlem. Lived on 134th Street. And when he died, there was just seven folk there, and it's an unmarked grave to this day. Read Jeffrey Perry's magnificent magisterial biography, and that's just volume one, you see. Hubert Harrison, historical amnesia. Everybody knows about Booker T. Washington. God bless the Negro. He founded a black institution. I'm for founding black institution on white money, on white elite money, against the unions, against our precious immigrants coming in, deeply pro-capitalist. Everybody knows Booker T. Washington. What about Hubert Harrison in the legacy of Tom Paine across race, we could go on. That's why Victoria Garvin, another powerful, magnificent voice. Who knows about the great Victoria Garvin? We need to know more historical amnesia again. But when times reach a point where the truth has to emerge, we're going to be so hungry for these voices because we're going to be needful of their insight, but most importantly, of their courageous example. Of their courageous example. Because at that point, you're either courageous or you go under. We're not at that point now. That's why I think one of the reasons why the folk were a little reluctant when she said revolutionary times. You see, I, I, I don't think we live in revolutionary times. I wish it were revolutionary times. Pain arrived at a moment where the revolution already in place. He just drops in. I wish we could just drop in <laughs> and have black folk and, and white and red and yellow already organized, already anti-imperialist, already anti-homophobic, already anti-capitalist, already anti-against Jewish hatred and Arab hatred, a hatred of Muslims and so forth. We can just drop in on that and then write a pamphlet. <laughs> hey, we're going to get together tonight and write that pamphlet. <laughs> We work all night and write that pamphlet. No, no, these are counter-revolutionary times where there's revolutionary awareness escalating given the defeat, the relative defeat of the left in the last 35 or 40 years with the counter-revolution triumphing in the name of capital in white supremacist 
garb even when you have black figures who are the public faces of it. You see, that's what our moment it seems to me, and I think that's one of the reasons why folk were a little bit leery about that, and I resonate with that leeriness, because we do want to be honest what we're up against. Right. You see, if we, none of us going to live through the revolution we're talking about at all. And some of us get crushed like cockroaches because the powers that be are powerful. They're mighty, but not, they're not almighty. Payne believed that the people organized were always mightier than the gangsters who run things. But the gangsters are powerful, very powerful indeed. There's no doubt about that. And vilification. Well, yeah, but I mean, I wouldn't compare my case to Thomas Paine. Yeah, good God Almighty. Yeah, Lord, Lord, Lord. No, but I mean, I, I just think that the, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's impossible to tell the truth, especially about the vicious legacy of white supremacy and its connection to capitalist exploitation without knowing you're a candidate for character and literal assassination. That's just a fact. Over 400 years, there has never been a person from John Brown on the vanilla side to Nat Turner to Ella Baker who was told the truth about white supremacy and its connection to capitalism who was not targeted chronically, systematically across the board. And that's why you have to have your spirit intact. You can, you can get it intact in a secular way. I get it intact with Je loving Jesus. People say whatever they want. That's you. I got my mother hugging life to live. <laughs> I got my integrity to preserve. You see? And how do you bear witness in the face of those kinds of lies and, and those kinds of crimes? And that's what they are. They're crimes against humanity. The new Jim Crow is a crime against humanity. The educational systems in our cities, those are crimes against humanity, the way those precious children are treated. You see, our working class abused in this way. Well, that's a crime against humanity. And the drones dropping bombs on innocent children. Vicious crimes against humanity in the name of the U.S. people. You have to just call it for what it is. But using that kind of language doesn't just get you in trouble, but it can get you killed. That's One last thought about this, and maybe there's a productive tension between Brother uh, Cornell and myself. We don't know where we are in the revolutionary process. You only know that afterwards. Was it the right time? Was it possible? Were the conditions in place? You never know. And part of what it means to be a critic in the spirit of Tom Paine is that you always got to push. You've got to push to see where and how far it can go. We are here, and you are here, and this is probably the biggest attendance that the, that is the whole three days here that the left forum has ever enjoyed. These are very interesting bits of information. I think we have to always be willing both to be cautious and honest about what we're up against. Absolutely right but always with a little space left for that unknowable reality when the things begin to happen really quickly. That author I referred to earlier from another place in time who made famous that question, what is to be done, was famous for another remark he made about this question. He said sometimes for decades, Nothing happens. And then in a few weeks, decades happen. We have to be open. Thomas Paine was open because if you're not open, you can't write that way. Part of the, it's not just the effect his writing has on the revolutionary situation, it's also the fact that a revolutionary situation, even when not grasped consciously, plays its role in shaping what it was possible for Thomas Paine to write. And we have to be in, in sync with that unknowable extra that's there, partly to live in a time like this, and partly 
to be able to be progressive in a time like this. Alexander Berkman, in an essay, writes about, uh, called, the essay is called The Invisible Revolution, precisely that point, where he talks about a life uh, in a revolutionary society as being like a kettle that is boiling, and that you don't actually see anything, that all of the uh, traditional edifices of power and structures not only remain in place, but appear monolithic. And that when they collapse, when they go down, it's, it appears to be absolutely sudden and unpredictable. And I, as a foreign correspondent, that was something that I experienced covering the revolutions in Eastern Europe, uh, including the East German Stasi state, uh, where uh, until our security and surveillance state was the most pervasive uh, 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 security apparatus in human history. We've, of course, done things the Stasi didn't even dream of. Um, and, uh, and what happened was you had, uh, in Leipzig, uh, mostly Lutherans uh, holding candlelit vigils, and they weren't even very clear about uh, they, if the, if their first demand was that they be legally recognized as a group. They hardly appeared revolutionary, and yet they, they captured that kind of zeitgeist, um, which I think is there within the American society, looking for a language to express itself. And, 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 and Paine gave revolutionary America that language. Um, but I think in that sense, we, we are lo rapidly losing faith in the institutions, the formal structures of power, uh, which have been become wholly owned subsidiaries of the corporate state. Um, but language is key, and Berkman makes that point, that as long as you can, you continue to speak in the false language of American democracy, liberty, how can you use the word liberty when every single one of us in this room has all of our electronic communications downloaded and stored in perpetuity by the NSA. You cannot use the word liberty uh, for a population that has wholesale surveillance. Um, you have to use the word slavery. Uh, and uh, any government that has the capacity to use that mechanism will use it. Hannah Arendt writes in The Origins of Totalitarianism that the the purpose of wholesale surveillance in a totalitarian state is not to find crimes, but to gather evidence. So at the moment that you seek to criminalize an entire group of people, you have the trivia. It's not evidence, because of course, at that point, crimes and truth and all of this is, is, is a fiction. But you have the material, and that's precisely what's happening to us. And so when that Stasi state fell. It fell in a week. And it fell when suddenly this handful of uh, protesters in Leipzig were joined by 70,000 people. And Eric Honecker, who had been in power for 19 years, sent down an elite paratroop division to fire on the crowd. And the paratroopers wouldn't do it. Mm. Just in the same way the Cossacks would not fire during the bread riots in Petrograd, which forced the Tsar to get into a railway carriage and and abdicate even before he got back to Petrograd. Okay. Um, and, so the, and the same thing happened in, uh, in East Germany. Honecker w was, gone, was gone within a week because those paratroopers would not shoot on the crowd. So I have a question that's completely related to what you just said. Um, because I think insofar as we're talking about the anatomy of revolution, we also need to talk about the anatomy of the counter-revolution. And how, if we are talking about a man who was an abolitionist and who was the great rhetorician of the revolution, we end up with a slaveholding republic. How it was that U.S., not colonial, but U.S. forces did fire on rebels in the Shays' Rebellion and the uprisings against debt uh, in that period between the Declaration of Independence and the writing of the Constitution. Thomas Paine supported the banks getting paid. He was against the mob. He said you get changed by rule of law or by the military or by the mob, and he was on the side of the law. Our laws come out of that period. Um, I'd love you to address the anatomy of the counter-revolution. Well, the thing to remember about Paine was that in Pennsylvania, uh, there was no divide between Whig and Tory. Uh, the Pennsylvania elite, which was Quaker and Anglican, were wholly on the side of the British monarchy. Uh, the Pennsylvania Assembly backed the propertied class. 
Uh, and so, unlike in the other colonies, the opposition to the king and the independence movement was expressed through pain and radical constitutionalists who had no connection with pre-revolutionary power. Um, and so that in Pennsylvania, after the revolution, those who take power, unlike every other colony, uh, had not been in power before. Now this alliance was extremely uneasy because as you correctly point out, with a slave-holding class, and let's forget, not forget, that uh, we had at the beginning of the revolution African-American soldiers until George Washington, a slaveholder, banned the conscription of blacks into the Continental Army. The only reason that the Southern slaveholding class supported the Republic, and they had remembered, they had had a rebellion of landless whites, the Bacon Rebellion in the 17th century, the only reason they supported it was because the laboring class was, who were black and enslaved were pushed out of the political system. So you have this kind of false narrative or false language that's used by figures like Jefferson while ignoring uh, huge percentages. So once the revolution is over, and they knew this even before the revolution, they had to push Paine out as fast as they could because that abolitionist, egalitarian uh, movement was uh, even at the time of the revolution uh, an alliance of convenience but made them very uncomfortable and on the issue of the banks and I'll let Rick deal with this more mm -hmm. um, I, and I would just say that Paine's conception of laissez-faire capitalism came out of Adam Smith not Malthus and and Adam Smith had a very benign view I'm now about to probably embarrass myself immensely, but, <laughs> but my very meager understanding, I'm a seminarian, not an economist, was anyway, that, that, that there was a kind of naive view that laissez-faire capitalism was an e you know, created a kind of equality, and um, I think Paine was wrong on, the, wrong on this, just as I think Paine was very uh, naive about human perfection, and mm. um, as Cornell would say, you know, a misunder uh, an inability to, to understand sin um, and human corruption, um, so that when Paine is in support of the banks and against the paper currency, which did cause hyperinflation, um, it comes out of this naive belief that that, that was a democratizing force. Well, no. mm -hmm. well, I mean, one of Paine has a developing views about the, the economy. It's very different what he says in Common Sense and what he says in The Rights of Man. And the last major piece, the agrarian justice, agrarian justice, and that second volume of, of rights, which is basically social democratic. Yeah. He called for the first person to call for guaranteed minimum income. Right. Guaranteed minimum income. And the very front page of his agrarian justice is every citizen ought to receive a lump of money when they're 15 and ought to receive another major lump of money when they're 45. From inheritance. No matter what. Inheritance. So that you break down the inheritance, transmittance of wealth at the top, and people get a chance to start their teenage years are new, and then right before the worms get you, about 45, start that anew again with another injection. But so at least, I mean, so he, he's very fragmented. He's not systematic, and he's certainly not marked uh, at all. But in regard to the banks, too, I think Thomas Paine's, well, Thomas Paine did not receive one penny from the money he got from Common Sense or from the Rights of Man. These are the two best-selling text in the history of the English language didn't give, receive a penny. Every penny, just like Martin King with, with the Nobel Prize, every penny went to the, the movement. Every penny went to the cause. Mm -hmm. When he called for the banks early on, that was a way of supporting, providing financial support for the war. And so they, we had to have a national entity that would provide some resources to keep the war going in an anti-imperial way. But, but he supported them he, off to Shays as well. Pardon? But he supported them off to Shays as well. What, but he did have a suspicion of the mob. The mob ought to deserve suspicion. The mob can be run by gangsters, too. You had to be very critical in this regard. When he talked about the people, he wasn't viewing it as an abstraction. He had a critical view toward whether there was democratic sensibility and vision when people talked about the people. Now, in Shays' Rebellion, I would argue, he was, still, he was still wrong. I'm not defending him in terms of a particular judgment, but his larger vision and sensibility is something I want to... Know. I guess I raise the question because of its relevance today as we try to decide where our allies are and define the, the basic composition of the community of the population that we're in. Because um, my other question to you has to do with 
this question of the intellectual revolutionary today. Because I think I disagree with you, Cornell. Um, oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> Somebody's right, wrong, but that's good to disagree. <laughs> I mean, on Grit TV, every week we're interviewing grassroots intellectual revolutionaries. I'm thinking of people like Max Rameau from The Right to the City. I'm thinking of people like Kali Akuno, who worked with Shokwe Lumumba in Jackson to take power and to call for a total transformation of the economic priorities of that city in a place where that was viable. I'm thinking of the dreamers with no access to power, with no access to the system, changing our entire um, the comfort of the Congress around their immigration policy, even Occupy. They got a lot of help from the media, but then they got a lot of hurt from the media. Um, but they raised the question of capitalism in a way that we could talk about it in a way that we hadn't been able to for years. So, I'm, yes, my suspicion of the mob makes me uncomfortable because some of my favorite people are in the mob. Um, and sometimes it's hard who's to tell who's the mob and who's the mob capital M. And the mob capital M are in government. Brother Rick, you want to jump in on us because we don't want to dominate, but I'll, I'll say something immediately after. But you, you go right ahead. Don't All right. Um, I don't want to dominate. Let's be generous to Tom Paine. He thought that many of the problems he saw accumulating in this society at the time of our colonial link to Britain could be overcome by a cataclysmic act, a revolution cutting us off from this society of which we had been a colony, rejecting the monarchy, rejecting the support, unbelievable. He then had to face, as many revolutionaries have, that what it was he thought was the problem turned out to be only part of the problem. It was a necessary but not a sufficient step to take to achieve the goals he so brilliantly put forward for us, that he so brilliantly expressed. So we learn in the aftermath of Thomas Paine, either with him or after he dies after him, that there's more to be done, that being an independent country cut off from your colonial master is necessary, but it's not sufficient. How many nations have been discovering that in the last 200 years, particularly in the so-called third world. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. What else has to be done? Well, what Law referred to. We have to understand that if we actually want to realize the goals of a Thomas Paine, whether they're articulated in the American idiom or in the liberty, equality, fraternity idiom of the French Revolution, more has to be done. That's what inspired, if I may be so bold, Karl Marx. That's who he is. He's born in the euphoria of the American and French revolutions. He's caught up in all of that. He believed in it. He loved it. It's just when he looked around Germany in his time, it wasn't happening the way it was supposed to. The end of the feudal regime hadn't brought liberty and equality and fraternity. It had brought capitalism, which they early thought might be the road to liberty, equality, and fraternity. And then they made this crucial discovery that capitalism isn't the bearer of liberty, equality, and fraternity. It's the biggest obstacle imaginable. And then begins the learning that we're part of that the next revolution, inspired and even made possible by the likes of Tom Paine, now have to be informed by what's our problem. And that isn't a king, that's a piece of theatrics in a few leftover countries who have to have kings and queens, and we feel empathy for the money they piss away on that. Our problem is an economic system. But it's not that Paine was wrong. He needed to open the space so we could get to what's on the agenda for the human race now. And that's an enormous debt we have to him. 
All right. So some other questions coming from the, uh, uh, from the audience. Lenin famously remarked in his article, Backward Europe, Advanced Asia, that the center of anti-capitalist revolutionary had, had revolution had switched to the third world in the era of monopoly capital. Do you agree? I don't think you can talk about the third world as monolithic. It depends on which corner of the world we're talking about. Uh, I don't think it can be broadly characterized in, in, in that way. Uh, in the same way that I, I agree with you in the examples that you gave, you see, folks who are telling the truth, exposing lies, bearing witness in the name of the struggles of poor and working people are not a mob. That's not the mob. Mm -hmm. See, it only becomes a mob when the gangsters take over. Just like the reign of terror, the French Revolution, that's when the mob spilled over into gangster activity in the name of the people. Just like they were gangsters in the name of the king. There's gangsters in the name of the church, gangsters in the name of the synagogue, gangsters in the name of Judaism, gangsters in the name of Christianity, gangsters in the name of B Buddhism or whatever. For Thomas Paine, and this is where, he, for, for, for him, actually, this was what he called a religious duty. He thought, as a deist, he's following the will of God by doing justly, loving mercy, loving mercy, and endeavoring to make his fellow creatures happy. That's the language from the rights of man. But in the, the essence of the question is, has the center of revolution shifted away from here to someplace else? It was it never be here. It was never in the in American empire. Since when has American empire been the center of revolution other than 1776 and possibilities in 1960? America has been the bastion of white supremacy and the rule of capital ever since 1776. Is that right, right Brother Wolf? People, we've had we've had resistance to the protests, more questions we but we haven't had a South Africa, we haven't had a Venezuela, we haven't had a Cuba, we haven't had a China, we haven't had, I mean, India in 1948. America has been the bastion of capital of of of, 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 of what, what Lenin called the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, and and that's why violence in America is vigilante violence. Uh, we are the, the you know what is it 80 80 out of every hundred Americans owns a weapon. And the government has nothing to fear because, and this is the problem, that, that the, the one sort of figure in our revolutionary intellectual tradition, Paine, which has been, who has been marginalized in silence, uh, has not had any heirs. Mm -hmm. and, and so, and Hofstetter writes about this in that book on violence quite presciently, that, uh, you know, you go back and look at American history, whether it's the slave patrols, or the Pinkertons, or Baldwin Feltz, or you know the the, the coal mining gun thugs, or uh, you know the vigilantes who shot down the miners at Blair Mountain. That, or, or you know, right up to the Tea Party, the militias. That violence in American society uh, doesn't revolve around, in a way that it did in Europe, around a, a transformative ideology, uh, but around these kind of proto-fascist hatreds. Uh, and that uh, that is something that, as we move forward as a nation, and 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 we endure the effects of climate change and economic disintegration, we are going to have to confront. Well, you know, look at Nevada. Suppose those people had been from Earth first, mm -hmm. or suppose they'd been black. What do you think would have happened? Amen. And and in a way, those vigilantes become important to the system, tolerated occasionally reprimanded, but tolerated because in a moment of crisis they become used by the capitalist state. So you have the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s, three to five million members, reign of terror in the South, taking over whole states, including Indiana, and, and that is something we are going to have to confront. These uh, you know, these armed militia figures, these survivalist cults, and Adam Lanza's mother was a member, these which have terrorized African Americans throughout their history uh, and, and, and been used to kill radicals, and Ludlow, those people were killed by vigilantes. Um, that, I think, is an example of how uh, the, the rage, a legitimate rage and anger, has been very skillfully manipulated to turn on the vulnerable, mm -hmm. on the scapegoats, on the weak. And let me just, in terms of revolutionary tradition, we should not forget that we are the British monarchy. Right. We are the empire. And we have the disease of empire. So that even, I don't talk to very many people in Princeton, except for Cornell, 
because even at Princeton University, you will get these absurd discussions about sending the 101st Airborne to Afghanistan to liberate women. Right. As if you can talk about, and I've been to war and they haven't, as if you can talk about human rights once you start using cruise and hellfire missiles. So I think the answer to the question was, don't worry about the uh, center of revolution shifting someplace else because it was never here. Um, but well, that doesn't mean you don't wait, struggle wait, here, though. One more question, because this topic has come up a lot in your questions. Um, and this is, can you connect Payne's radicalism to the immediate crises associated with climate change? There's a couple of questions related to climate change. Does climate change give us a, an opportunity, galvanize a revolutionary segment of society, or will business continue as usual until it's too late? And if we had a source of abundant energy, would we have a revolution? Well, here... Uh, I'll let Rick and Cornell address this as well, but here I would break with Paine. Paine not only believed in, like the Enlightenment, human perfectibility, um, but he also believed in, uh, wholeheartedly, in material advancement and material progress. And he said the, the earth is given to us as our inheritance. To yeah, and he broke with Jefferson on this. I mean, Jefferson was terrified of the Industrial Revolution and wanted to sort of slow its effect Payne saw it as a benefit, and, and you know, Payne often talked about uh, uh, giving up political activity, and he designed an iron bridge, and he had, like many of the artisan class of the day, a deep interest in science. So uh, I think, you know, if we talk about blind spots in Payne, that would probably be uh, a one, yeah. Well, I, I think the, the way I would connect Payne to the, the whole climate thing is it sort of we are now forced to see yet another consequence of capitalism and the way its intrinsic logic endangers us. That is, it's not just, as Piketty shows us, that it produces absurd social inequalities that are self-destructive, but it also distorts our relationship to the, to the uh, ecosphere and that it's another argument, but it doesn't then just takes us back to having to confront we have an economic system that is fundamentally dysfunctional for the vast majority of us. What are we going to do about this situation? And no matter how alarmist your reaction to the environmental, it really is another kind of alarmism that you can likewise generate for social inequality and for many of the other consequences of capitalism that always bring you back to, are we able now to think through a relationship to capitalism that's parallel or comparable to what pain took us through in thinking our relationship to a colonial master. Mm -hmm. And that means the oligarchs and the plutocrats of our day, Wall Street, big banks and big corporations, are the equivalent of the monarchs in history. That's right. It means that poverty is a new slavery. It means that the new Jim Crow is an intense form of slavery. It means that working people locked into a declining uh, economy in which wages stagnate, pr prices escalate, and profits go hit the top is also a form of slavery, metaphorically and literally speaking. And we need language like that to somehow seize the imagination of people to begin to see, lo and behold, there's either a way out or there's not. Mm. Now, climate change for me is a very serious issue. I don't think it's going to be the catalytic issue. I think it's either going to be revolutionary transformation that allows us to get some control over banks and corporations so we can treat nature as a thou rather than an it. But when I hear a lot of the discourse of climate change, I hear people thinking, oh, my God, my life is going to be like a wasteland. Well, you know, for poor people, it's a wasteland every day. <laughs> every day. Every year, year after year, year after year. So how do we make the connection between the climate change agents on the one hand, but also those who are wrestling with these new forms of slavery in the neoliberal capitalist regimes around the world? And to recoup one little piece of credit for the United States, Thomas Paine teaches us to think about revolution as a matter of changing a system. That's a very powerful contribution. 
It made him stand out from others at his time, and it's urgently necessary for more of us nowadays to be willing and able to confront not this or that outrage, not this or that intrusion on our lives, but a system that supports and reinforces all of that and will outwit us as long as we don't confront it as a system, and that we need Thomas Paine's help to do. Mm. Well, on the system's point, it's worth remembering that the Tea Party, after all, was not against the king so much as against the company, the East India Company, and the, mer the relationship between the, ro the royal power, the monarchy, and the corporation, something very familiar today. Looking at all of this, uh, a couple of people wanted to ask your exact suggestions. We have your suggestions for how to keep hope, your suggestions for how to start an organized movement, uh, and your suggestion for things people can mobilize around today. And I'm com condensing a few different questions, but insofar as Payne put forward concrete suggestions, whether it was around the, con the Continental Congress or around the um, inheritance tax, and the guaranteed minimum income, what would yours be today? Are there things like that that one could organize or you would like to see us organizing around? And we've got about four minutes. I'll give you five. <laughs> well, let me start while my colleagues figure out what they're going to say. Um, I have one thing that I get out of Thomas Paine, although I get it from other places too, that I think begins to confront a systemic issue. We depend as human beings on the enterprises in our society that produce the goods and services without which life cannot continue. Our food, our clothing, our shelter, our transportation, and everything else. We permit the institutions that we depend on, the productive institutions, to be organized in a fundamentally undemocratic way that leave all the decisions those that affect the environment, those that affect the distribution of wealth, those that affect everyday life, in the hands of a tiny number of people that sit atop the pyramid of these institutions, what we call corporations. If we don't want this set of outcomes we call the consequences of capitalism, then we have to fundamentally alter the organization of production. If we want the production of goods and services, the core economic base of our lives, to serve all of us, then we have to be in charge of them. And it can't be a subset of us that arrogates that position to itself. The radical transformation, what Chakwe Lubumba was beginning to do and talk about uh, in Jackson, Mississippi, is part of a broadening recognition that that fundamental revolution that reorganizes production is where we have to go to achieve, to concretize where pain's work pushes us. Anyone else? Yeah, just very brief. I'm thoroughly convinced that if 40% of America's children lived in poverty and one out of three of America's children, of, of young people, were on parole and prison or probation, it'd be a very different historical moment. If 40% of white children lived in poverty and one out of three of white young brothers between 18 and 26 were on parole, probation, or in prison, we'd have a different moment. It'd be maybe a revolutionary moment which means that we're going to have to say, do something about the vicious legacy of white supremacy and its relation to the neoliberal capitalist regime that is so tied to lies and crimes. So the issue of black and brown and, and folk is not just a moral a issue of being morally sensitive. It is an anti-systemic issue that goes right back to what Brother Wolf is talking about, and that's precisely the reason why black young people are disproportionately targeted because the only time we've had the possibility of that was in the 1960s, and they came at it so viciously. That's why we still got the political prisoners and the warriors that are there. They came at us viciously, and they're ready to come back viciously again. The difference will be this time, it will be blackface that will also lead the vicious attack. Mm -hmm. The Carl Rowans and the others who lied on Malcolm, lied on Martin, they, they were not in positions of power. Now you've got black elites at the very top of the empire who can facilitate the vicious attacks. That's why Asante Shakur is on the top 10 list, being a terrorist with a black president in the White House. Mm. And she's a black freedom fighter. And we don't want to say a word about it. Shame on us.
in terms of the legacy of what folk went through just 30 or 40 years ago in these kind of settings where they told the truth and look what they had to go through and we so easily turn our backs and say, lo and behold, their service, their sacrifice can be marginalized in the same way that our dear brother Thomas Paine. One last point, footnote. There's only one figure that's comparable to Thomas Paine, David Walker, appeal to colored citizens of the world. And David Walker did what? Wrote his text and died in that hotel room 11 months after, after the spies got to him. But he went with a smile the way Thomas Paine went with a smile because he told the truth and he exposed lies and he bore witness. Chris, you got a minute. Uh, I would say that the reason we are in such an incendiary moment is that the political and economic and cultural oppression of poor people of color is now being visited on the sons and daughters of the white middle class. And that is basically the engine of the Occupy movement. These are day class A intellectuals. Bakunin always cited these day class A intellectuals as vital for revolution, arguing with Marx on this, but Bakunin was right. So suddenly you have the sons and daughters, white, who endure police oppression, who can't get a job, or at least a job where they can sustain themselves, who are enduring what poor people, marginalized people of color have been endured for decades. And at that moment, the state is in serious serious trouble because an alliance between an alienated white essentially middle class or formerly middle class or middle class is disappearing of course those people of color especially low wage working poor uh, is one that I think w once is galvanized can begin to create and that's why the fight for the minimum wage is absolutely crucial debt peonage is a form of political control it's put on there on purpose. Ask any African-American. It's how sharecroppers were kept in slavery long after slavery was officially abolished. And what we have done to college students in this country is absolutely criminal. I mean, my son is in France. I said, if you told French college students uh, that they'd have to pay $50,000 a year to go to college, they'd shut the damn country down, which is precisely what you should be doing here. All right. Um, so everybody. So I will just close by saying something's coming. It's always, it's always the ruling elites that determine the configurations of rebellion. They are unable to respond rationally to the mortgage foreclosure crisis, to the job crisis, to climate change. They, know, they have no internal limits. They will exploit until exhaustion or collapse, and there will be blowback. Mm. I want to just thank our participants, Cornell West, Chris Hedges, Rick Wolf. Talk to your neighbors before they join the vigilantes and make revolution, everybody. Thank you. I just want to thank our friend here, Victor Madison from the Thomas Paine Friends, who's been brought these in beautiful posters to give to each of us. They have, uh... Book TV is on Facebook.